the recording. Great. Thanks, EJ. All right, so let's get started with some housekeeping stuff first. Um, a warm, warm welcome to everyone who's here and everyone who's you know watching the recording afterwards to the final concluding event of our April IEC Appreciation Month. If this is your first Polygen's IEC Appreciation Month event, welcome. Uh, we've designated April of this year as a special time to celebrate our incredible IEC community, to recognize all the hard work that you've done with families, with students, to support them, both academically and let's be honest, emotionally. Um, and to also give ourselves the space to take a step back now that the admission season is over and to reflect on how things went this year with one of our you know, leading voices um, in higher education, Jeff, which I'll be introducing in just a bit. Um, for those of you who are completely new to Polygens, welcome to this community and intellectual space. Um, we work very closely with the IEC community to help their students with research, to help their students discover their passions and to give them an edge in their future college applications. We are not a college consulting company and never will be, but we're really excited to partner and to support with uh, support all of you all. And so um, without further ado, I wanted to introduce a very special guest who will be joining me for this fireside chat, Jeffrey Salingo, renowned journalist, reporter, and writer. Um, and just a reminder that this event will go for around one hour and 15 minutes. The first hour will be a fireside chat with Jeff, and then the last 15, 10 to 15 minutes will be for our raffle event, for um, raffling off four pro bono polydense research projects. And let me introduce Jeff real quick and then let him say a few words about himself. So Jeff has written about higher education for more than two decades and is a New York Times bestselling author of three books. His latest book, which you may have caught us talking about earlier, um, Who Gets In and Why? A Year Inside College Admissions, was published in September 2020 and was named among the 100 notable books of the year by the New York Times. He is a regular contributor to The Atlantic, also a special advisor for uh, innovation and professor of practice at Arizona State University. He also co-hosts the podcast Future You, which we will put in the chat again for um, people who didn't see it earlier. Um, and Jeff, a super warm welcome to you, to Polygents, and really excited to have you here today. So if you want to say a few words to welcome our IEC community as they continue to trickle in before we get started. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the invite. It's, it's fantastic to be here. Um, big fans of the IEC community. They were incredibly helpful uh, to the book when I was reporting it uh, a couple of years ago, have been really supportive of it. Since then, uh, they they many communicate with me often, and I'm sorry that I can't respond to every single message, but uh, but really appreciate um, all the work that you do for students. So really excited to get uh, going in this hour and and answer uh, all the questions that are, are are going to be out there. Amazing, and so a few words about the structure of today's chat. Um, it will be a fireside chat. It will be theme based. And minus the, the fire, but <laughs> minus the fire. Yeah, the fire is burning in our hearts. Um, in the next 25 minutes, I'll take Jeff through sort of three major themes that so many of you have asked about in your registration forms. One is recent trends in admissions, um, and then zooming in on test optional admissions trends post COVID. And then the third being student mental health and sort of family mental health and then the admissions rat race. Um, and then opening it up uh, for the last sort of 30, 35 minutes for open Q&A. Um, and there is a Q&A uh, button on the Zoom panel on, on the bottle on the bottom if you wanted to put your questions there. And then later on when we open up for Q&A, if you wanted to unmute, you know, turn on your video and ask questions, just raise your hand and um, our Polygens team members will also figure that out so that you can, you know, have a live conversation with Jeff as well. Um, so I'll just quickly introduce myself and then let's get started. I'm Jin, I'm one of the co-founders of Polygents. Super excited to have all of you here today. Born and raised in Hong Kong, came to the US as an international student. So I'm very familiar with the international undergrad sort of um, competitive admissions. Um, did comparative literature at Princeton and then went on to Stanford to start my PhD. Um, and then I'm a proud Stanford PhD dropout because then I started Polygents. Um, with my co-founder, who's also on this call, Janusz. Um, and yeah, been working on this for four years to inspire students, to help them discover their passions and their calling in life. So excited to organize this event and to have Jeff with us. So shall we get started, Jeff? Uh, we should get started. Looking forward Let's to it. it. So there have been lots of momentous trends in tech and society over the past year that 
have had a significant impact and will have a significant impact on upcoming admissions. Let's talk about some of them. And AI and the rise of ChatGPT is certainly top of mind for every single person, I think, on this call. How are you thinking about it? And, and how do you think admissions will change or adapt? Well, I think that you know one of the big concerns is using um, is using ChatGPT uh, and, and AI around um, around the essay in particular. Um, and you know, right now, clearly, ChatGPT is not really that useful to personal essays um, because it can't think like people. Um, but it could definitely help in the overall writing of those essays. And so, I think you know that that is a concern. I think that most admissions officers believe that uh, that students get a lot of help uh, in many cases with their essays anyway, from teachers, from counselors, from independent counselors, from parents and others. Um, and so there's already belief that that students are already getting a decent amount of help with that particular part of the application, probably more than any other uh, piece of the application. And so I'm not quite sure we're going to see a, a change, a major change right now. Uh, eventually, I think that if if the if the AI technology gets better, um, where you know uh, ChatGPT, for example, can write a really good personal essay for an admissions uh, for an admissions application, I think we then may see colleges and universities looking for other assets. Where I though believe that AI actually might have a larger impact on admissions more quickly is on the other side of the desk, and that is the colleges and universities. I had a provost at a Big Ten uh, university asked me recently about experiments with using AI in admissions uh, because of the volume of applications that most big publics and more selective privates have been getting the last couple of years, right? We, you know, one of the trends we're gonna be talking about today is a 30% rise uh, um, just among the Common App members at the most selective colleges, or overall, I should say, with most of that 30% rise over the last three years in the volume of applications going to these more selective publics and privates. Uh, it's, you know, if, you, if you've been reading the news, you know, the Chronicle just had this piece on turnover in the admissions office. It's, it's a, at a much faster and larger pace uh, than any other division on co in colleges and universities. Uh, they can't hire people from the VP for enrollment all the way down to uh, the average admissions counselor. Uh, they're having, you know, every time I talk to a big public, which tends to hire either graduate students or part-time readers and part-time readers uh, for their applications are having trouble doing that as well. And they just can't keep up with the volume of applicants. So they can do one of two things. They could ask for less. Uh, and, and it seems like nobody wants to do that quite yet. Uh, or they could use AI in terms of I think where we're going to move to this, and I think move to it pretty quickly. I know of one major experiment going on at a research university right now is kind of at the first pass uh, at the uh, at the application. In other words, can we take a, a pool of thirty five thousand applicants and get it down much more quickly to twenty thousand applicants without human intervention? The question is whether applicants and others will, how will they respond to that? Will colleges and universities be transparent that they're doing that? Um, and are we thinking that's still holistic admissions? Because I think when we think holistic admissions, we think that there is a human on the other side that is looking at that. That is super interesting. And I mean, part of, for, from your book and also just from, I think, just general knowledge, like being an AO admissions officer is actually an extremely grueling task. Like, yes, <laughs> human, but it, I mean, they read what, like thousands of files and some of these they read in like three, four minutes. It's like an extremely mentally and emotionally taxing and, and exhausting uh, piece of work. And so it, I've never really thought about it this way before, but it totally makes sense that that's an area where universities are thinking about AI. Um, but I also wonder, like, would you have any advice for our IECs here for how to support their families through both thinking about the rise of AI on their side of admissions, meaning their kids maybe wanting to use AI or whether we want to call it cheating or not, or sort of leaning on it, um, as well as on the other side, like the what you were just talking about, the rise of using AI in the whether it's first pass or deciding who gets an interview or you know yeah. those kinds of things. I mean, I, I, you know, AI is come right. It's here already um, in so many ways, and it's only going to get to be a bigger part of our lives, um, and it's more so going to get to be a bigger part of the lives of undergraduates. Um, not only in college, but mostly post-college, because most every job 
is going to have a piece of it um, that is going to be done by automation and artificial intelligence. And that's only going to increase over the next 10 or 15 years. And so what I think we need to think about is how do we help our students complement technology, you know, rather than either compete with it or see it as a cheating mechanism. I kind of hate that framing of chat uh, GPT. For example, what I use chat GPT for a lot is uh, is asking better questions. So, uh, you know, I'm a journalist. I ask a lot of questions. Uh, I host a podcast. I ask a lot of questions. And so when I'm um, you know, kind of preparing for a podcast or preparing for an interview uh, and I'm looking to, you know, get answers to some basic questions, for example, I'll put it in chat GPT and then I'll say, oh, that's not really the answer that I want. And I'll keep refining the question uh, to be asked. And I really find it to be a useful tool for my work in that and refining that question. And I think students can think of the same thing, like refining their applications, refining their essays. Uh, I think using that as a, you know, using ChatGPT essentially in some cases as an editor uh, on pieces of the essay that can be, you know, edited in that way. Again, can't really write a personal essay, but I don't think that's any different than the way we've used uh, you know, other tools uh, uh, in, you know, whether that's in, in Google or Word or other things to help us with, you know, spelling and grammar and things like that. I see it as no different than a tool in that way. Totally. And even at Polygens, like sometimes we use ChatGPT for getting ideas for whether it's generating new content or marketing. And it's just such a versatile tool that I think, especially in the case of education, the more you ban it and the more you, you make it seem like the bad guy, the more tempted actually students will be will be to use it for, you know, for things that they're not supposed to use it for. And I think part of it is the education around how to use it, which I think you you hit the nail on the head. Um now, moving to a, to a slightly different um, trend that is no less, you know, or maybe even more controversial than AI and ChatGPT that has sort of risen to the forefront of the industry, I think, is the, the concept or the, or the idea of diversity and um, on college campuses and how best to achieve it. Um, obviously, with the upcoming Supreme Court ruling that's supposed to come out sometime this summer and all the debates that we've seen about racial, socio socioeconomic, religious diversity on campuses, um, I'd love to hear sort of your thoughts on it and how you think that the, the, the conversation has changed since you were in, you know, in the admissions office during that year. Um, well, I think uh, I think that we have a, a really big misunderstanding, in my opinion, on how race is used in admissions, particularly at selective colleges. You know, race is, you know, race is used in financial aid and scholarship programs and pre-college programs at a bunch of universities beyond the selectives. But really where affirmative action and admissions really matters is at those places where seats are scarce and there's more applications than they kind of know what to do with, right? So we're really talking about, again, the more selective colleges and universities, which is about 200 um, plus. And I, and I think that, uh, you know, in listening, for example, last fall to the oral arguments in the Harvard and UNC cases that are before the Supreme Court right now, it was really interesting to me that the justices on both sides, you know, if we kind of see this as two sides, because uh, I kind of think we all know where this decision is likely going to land. But um, if, if you listen to if you listen to those oral arguments, there's this belief that there is a, you know, let's set aside the, the politics of it all and the legal issues of it all. There's this belief that uh, that the use of race is is really used in in in, in a separate admissions uh, place, right? It's a, 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 a separate avenue uh, of admissions, right? There was so often during those our arguments that the belief is that, you know, as soon as a student checks that they are underrepresented, they are going to end up in a different pile. They're going to be looked at differently uh, right from the beginning. And that is just not the case at you know, the majority of the universities that I've talked to, uh, in the universities I sat in on, uh, where, where race could be considered, you know, University of Washington, which was one of the places I embedded, not allowed to use race uh, in admissions under under state uh, law, but uh, but you know at Emory where it was being used, uh, very similar to where I how I think it's used and how I hear it's used at many other colleges and universities, where it truly is this plus factor at the end, and and so what ends up happening is that you have 
you know, all of these students who are kind of in the realm of possibility for admissions. And then what you're doing is, is looking for reasons to kind of bring them into the fold or in many cases, push them out. And, and, and that's where race and is used. That's where alumni status and legacy status is used often. That's where gender is used uh, often. That's where a student's major might be used, a student's high school, other factors you know, other hooks, essentially, beyond athletics, which is a separate, by the way, kind of a separate avenue into the college. Um, and so I, I think that there is this fundamental misunderstanding that I think even among the public that, oh, um, uh, you know, X student got in just because they are, you know, fill in the blank. And, um, and was that one of the reasons they got in? Certainly, I'm not going to deny that. But um, but I, again, I think that the fact that the belief that these students are wholly unqualified or they wholly came in under a different uh, a different admission system uh, is is just not fair. Um, when meanwhile, there is a system that brings students in in a wholly different admission system, and that is for athletics. Um, and I'm I'm a big sports fan, but if we're gonna kind of say anything's unfair, I'm sorry, I think that's the side. That is 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 really unfair in, in my opinion. Yeah. And I, I believe you wrote one of your first books exactly on on sort of athletics and, and admissions, and you explore that a lot. And I think this is actually really helpful because I think the way the affirmative action suit is portrayed in the in the media, obviously, is often extremely black and white and doesn't go into the nuances. And if you haven't been in an admissions office or you, or if you haven't been in IEC working day in, day out with students, it's actually like it's, it's no wonder that that the that the view and the you know understanding of of what diversity means for a college is is so sort of um, stilted. But I think um, yeah, what you said makes a lot of sense, and it's super helpful to sort of. Yeah, and I, I get it because I think that I mean we're, we're at a point now again where we have this huge influx of applicants and uh, applications, I should say, and yeah. um, and 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 not enough seats, and and to me. That is the issue we should be addressing. We should be addressing either how do we increase the size of these institutions that everybody wants to go to, um, number one, or number two, how do we broaden the scope of institutions that people want to look at? Uh, you know, admissions is, is inherently unfair, right? We are picking one student over another for various reasons, some of which, to be honest with you, we sometimes can't explain. Um, and, and I think it's unfair on a, on a variety of fronts. Um, and, it, and to me, to pick this one out is, um, is just often a, a red herring, in my opinion. Yeah. Let's actually return to that. What do you think universities will do, are doing for this whole supply and demand, not meeting each other question? And are there other sort of non-college avenues that students should be taking a serious look at just because, you know, given the, the number of seats, it's just not going to be for everyone? Yeah, I mean, they're not they're not really doing much at all, right? When when you look at the top 20, 25 colleges and universities in the U.S. News and World Report, uh, especially, by the way, uh, the privates, um, they are essentially the same size as they were in the 1970s, even though the, the, we have had this huge influx of students um, applying to college. So they're, they're essentially not doing anything. And so it's not going to get any easier. It's not going to ch- it's really not going to change. I think for us to sit here and say, oh, in five years when there's this demographic cliff, you know, all of these elite selective colleges are suddenly going to see a huge drop off in applications. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. We, we, we see this big uh, push toward um, what we perceive as quality, right? We're, we're, you know, we have a lot of questions now about value. So I think that there is this flight toward uh, the more selective colleges and universities. And, and as a result, I, I don't think that's going down. So we can do one of two things. We could either say, you know, we're not going to participate in that, or we're going to participate in that and just take our chances and, um, you know, let the chips fall where they may. And we kind of know where those chips increasingly are falling. Um, we're going to broaden our our belief in what makes a good college. And that's where I believe we should focus our time and effort. And I know every IEC will say, I try this every year. I talk to families about all these other colleges we could be looking at. And Jeff, they just don't want to do it, right? They just don't want to look. And and I and to be honest with you, I'm, I'm working on another uh, uh, book proposal now, and I'm trying to figure out how to get 
families to come up with a framework so that they could start to look at others. Because this is, again, it's not going to change. And then either that, or we have to look at the question you just asked, alternatives uh, yeah. to college and, and what those might be. And, um, you know, and, and, and we've always thought that there might one day be good alternatives to college, but I just finished a big report on the value of the bachelor's degree. And I have to say, the bachelor's degree is as valuable as ever. Um, you know, we, we looked at all this data from, from burning glass on jobs and, and postgraduate outcomes. Uh, and, you know, we could get deeper into this if you want, but, you know, basically the bachelor's degree starts paying off for the majority of students right after they graduate, they get that bump in salary over somebody with a high school diploma and they have it for 12 years. Now, we could argue, by the way, that the high school diploma has become a lot less valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and thus, it's not that the bachelor's degree has gotten that much more valuable, but that distance between the two is significant in a way that I think as we look to alternatives to college, we should not look at people not foregoing the bachelor's degree, but are there other avenues to getting that bachelor's degree, whether that is working first, uh, whether that is taking a gap year, whether that is finding a passion project, right? And, and trying to figure out, okay, maybe I work on this for a while while I take some classes that eventually could transfer into a bachelor's degree. I'm not saying that everybody needs to graduate from high school and three months later become a full-time residential student somewhere. That's the question I think we should be asking. Totally. I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and switch, switch us to talking a little bit about the other big sort of elephant trend in the room, which is test optional admissions. Um, two questions bundled into one. How optional is it sort of for, from, from your point of view? And the second question is, let's say it, it is somewhat optional. How are extracurriculars now viewed? Like, and and how, what's the evolution of that perspective from when you were shadowing admissions all the way to now? Um, I wish I could really answer that question, how optional it is. I, it's really not that optional, especially among students where the expectation is they will have taken a test and, and, done, and done well. Um, but there's so many caveats to that, right? So, for example, I was talking to an admissions dean at a big public university that is really trying to rise up in the rankings um, and he was telling me, you know, I, I wish that some of these students didn't send test scores because they came from strong high schools and we would have taken them if they didn't submit their test scores because now we have their test scores and, you know, we don't really want that data uh, to be uh, affecting our, you know, overall number, our overall test score average, because that is an average that we really want to, you know, push up um, to, to do better um, in, in various rankings and things like that. So, I think the biggest problem is, is we don't have a lot of insight into what the test score means, right? I, I wrote a big piece for New York Magazine about six months ago on this subject. Um, it's because we don't have a lot of data. Colleges are very close to the vest on this. They're not very transparent on this. Um, it's actually a, a session that I'm proposing for NACAC in the fall about how we can get better and more data in real time from colleges and universities. In other words, what do we need to know and when do we need to know it? Um, and I think that if we try to push colleges to go in that direction of providing more information in real time, I think students can provide uh, or, or make better um, make better decisions. You asked, okay, what else, right? So obviously when they don't have a test score, or even by the way, when they have a test score, what are they really looking at? And, and they are digging deeper into transcripts. They're digging deeper into, you know, into high school, uh, into the courses students take and into the grades they get. I think on the, on, the, on the extracurricular activities, they really want to see some sort of plan, passion, uh, some sort of deliberate way of thinking about activities. And I think that students still, and, and I see this where I live um, and talking to parents, I still think that parents really are pushing students starting in ninth grade and 10th grade to kind of do it all, to really kind of fill in all those blanks on the Common App. Um, and and it's it, I still think that it's quality over quantity and in, in the admissions offices I were in, I was in and the admissions officers I still talk to on a regular basis. Um, and I think that's the that's the message that's being missed 
Um, and it's why I think students are really stressed out because they are trying to do it all in the classroom and trying to do it all outside the classroom. And, and I, again, I think that if there's a deliberate reason why a student has picked these three or four activities and they can be clear about that in their application, um, they're not going to get deemed. And, and I, I think that there is, there's too much pressure on students right now um, to do more. Um, and to do it all and to have that variety and diversity of activities. Um, and I don't think that is serving. Um, and I'm not saying that there's some admissions officers that don't like that, but I don't think that's serving the students particularly well right now, particularly when it comes to mental health. I think that probably is something that resonates so much with every one of us here, just because ICs, whether it's ICs or us, we work with parents where we see the student being pulled in so many different directions, sports, debate, research with us academics, you name it, um, and the kind of um, stress and, and mental health toll, which we'll speak about in, in just a second, that that, I think, manifests in the student is just so heart-wrenchingly sad, I think, and, and so unnecessary. Um, and I'm actually curious, um, sort of during your year reading reading files and being an admissions officer, um, being an admissions officer, can you tell us about like the most memorable, quirky, either extracurricular or, or file or profile that you've read um, that really stuck with you? Hmm. It's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I, I do want to correct the record. I was not an admissions officer for that. Mm -hmm. uh, that year, I have tremendous respect for people who do this on, on a regular basis. You know, I, I sat in offices with them. I didn't make any decisions myself mm -hmm. um, or anything like that, but uh, but uh, but but saw that. Um, I think the, the one uh, that comes to, you know, a couple that come to mind are, um, you know, a football, I remember this one uh, at Emory where it was a football player and they started the, um, they started a, uh, a crafts club, right, uh, at school. Um, and, and, and it's just like one of these, um, you know, it kind of dispelled this notion uh, or dispelled this stereotype, I guess, of a football player, right, that they're not into the arts, right, that they wouldn't start, especially not only join an arts club, but, but you know, start it, right? Um, and so it's those things that I think are unexpected um, that uh, really rise to the top. Uh, remember, they cherish what is rare. Um, and I think that sometimes parents see, you know, and it, it, but it also can't be forced. Um, and maybe in this case it was forced. They don't really, you never really know, right? Because you don't get to talk to these students, you don't get to meet these students. But it, it felt genuine because it came up, and, and this is where I think it feels genuine, when the narrative about a student is pretty consistent. Um, and and the, and the consistency often is what I saw the admissions officers looking for. And where do they see that consistency? They see that consistency in the course selection. So in this case, it's a, a student that is strong in the arts and the humanities and the sciences, right? And there's balance in the transcript on that. Um, a, a teacher or counselor brings that up in the, in the recommendation. Uh, it comes through in the essay in some form. It comes through in these activities and that there is consistency across the application. And I think what's often lost, um, and I think this is where IECs are really helpful uh, to families, is that I think in a rush to finish how many of our applications somebody is doing, um, and I saw this in a lot of the students I followed as well the year I did this book, is that you know they have these massive you know Google uh, Drive doc in documents, and they have a lot of thoughts in different places. They have uh, personal statements and essays in different places, and and they're kind of as they're putting together their applications, they're just pulling, cutting, and pasting over and over again. Not, to, not only does that increase the chance of mistakes, of course, but what it misses to me is the narrative. Is the narrative of a student, you have 10 to, I keep telling students this, right? You have 10 minutes, say, just let's put on average 10 minutes to persuade that person on the other side of the desk that you're not going to get to speak to, um, to admit you. And, and you want to put your best foot forward. So what is that story? If you got them trapped in an elevator for 10 minutes, what is that story that you want to tell that admissions officer on the other side of the desk? Think about that application in that way. And, and I think what's lost often when students just kind of, it's an assembly line of applications. 
And they're just kind of pulling different things for different schools, not really thinking, what does the school really want? What do I think the school really wants? I think that narrative, that story um, is really um, is really missing. That's such a good point. That narrative arc, I, I know for a fact, is, is exactly what you said, what so many IAC spend so much time helping students craft. And, and it's essentially a storytelling exercise, right? Yeah. And the extracurricular is a part of it. The grades are a part of it. Test scores may be a part of it. And it's it's about that packaging in, in the end that makes it a coherent story. And yeah, that's really helpful. Um, now, moving on to the to the final topic, which we kind of alluded to um, on student mental health and, and, and this question of failure. Um, with admissions becoming so much more competitive year after year after year, um, how have you seen it sort of impact students' mental health? And, and how do you see students cope or not cope with this idea of failing to get into XYZ school? I, uh, <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of pressure on them. I think there's a lot of pressure uh, from society because it's the only schools we talk about uh, often in the media. Um, I think depending on what kind of high school you go to, I think there's a lot of pressure in high schools. Um, I hate social media for this. I really do. I wish that I get and I hope that I don't do this in the six years when my oldest graduates, maybe I'll figure out a way to tell people, yeah, they're going to X place. But uh, I, I love that we celebrate our children, right? It's great. But these um, these over the top social media posts, and I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but it's just, it constantly plays into this idea, um, you know, this kind of FOMO effect and everything in, in social media that, oh, that kid got in, I didn't get in, right? Um, and I think it, it, it really even impacts the parents um, who often I think are trying to relive their own college search through their children. And so I, 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 I cannot, um, you know, I, I cannot miss the fact that, you know, all of this ratcheting up really has um, uh, really has kind of co coincided, not only with the rise of social media, but, you know, every Facebook group out there, which I, I, I love many of these Facebook groups, because I think they're also supportive communities. But it, all it does is kind of feed into this, like, you know, we're only talking about the same schools. My kid gets in, your kid didn't. It's it's just I think that's what really ratchets up the the pressure on on students. And at the end of the day, they don't know they really don't know what they're buying they, yeah. until they go. Um, and it's really interesting because the 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 three um, students who were in the book, you know, I, I I followed a couple dozen for the book, but I profile three in the book, and they're all seniors now. And so I'm about to. I'm going to be writing about what happened to them over the last four years. Obviously, COVID had a huge impact on them. But um, but one thing that you find, and, and I bet you every IEC has every story out there imaginable from students that they've helped over the years, is that people find their place. Do they find it right off the bat? Do they get rejected from their you know the place they really wanted to go and they end up at some place they didn't want to and they have a terrible time sure and they probably transfer or something else happens or maybe they do end up liking it um but everybody has that story um and i think that for the most part most of these students have not ever had that rejection right they haven't had that failure um, and I don't think as parents, we're doing them any favor by getting upset about it, by getting, oh, my God, what do you mean my kid didn't get in? Whose fault is that, right? Blaming somebody else all the time. Uh, I just, I don't know how to solve this. Um, I do know, though, that all the increase in discussion about admissions, which has definitely increased over the last 10 years, again, because of the rise of social media, uh, I think has not been helpful in us helping students find that next path. That's such a good point. And even now, I'm uh, when I look at some of these groups, or like I have, you know, my family friends who have kids who are about to go and get into college. That the the amount of like fear mongering and like anxiety that just oozes out of every single post is is it's um so palpable in, in a way that even if the students aren't the ones looking, like I'm sure the students feel it from the parents vicariously, you know, when they're interacting and whatnot. Um, but I think what's also interesting is on the other side of the coin, we don't really talk that much about sort of the stress and the mental health toll that this takes on our IECs and on the people who are, you know, sitting on the other side of the desk when we talked about admissions officers. Um, what what can we do to make sure that, you know, the mental health toll on, on, on those communities is also not skyrocketing, which I'm sure it is because of because of the way 
things are right now. Yeah, I mean, I think the toll is, is being taken on everybody, right? It's it's on the IECs, it's on high school counselors, it's on college uh, admissions officers as, as well. I mean, the workload is just hard. And I think that um, I just wish that more people would practice kindness uh, through this process. Is it a big deal? Sure, right? It is a big decision. Um, and it's a lot of work uh, to get to that next stopping point in life, but it's not the last one. It's not the only one. And I keep reminding students of that, um, that, uh, that these, you know, these things, it's interesting. I, I was interviewed um, by, um, you know, Rick Clark yesterday for his podcast and Brendan Bernard, and, and, and those names probably sound pretty familiar to a lot of ICs because they're authors of books. And Rick is the Dean of Admissions, Director of Admissions at, at Georgia Tech. Um, and at some point during our conversation, I've known both of them for years. And at some point during our conversation, they both mentioned their college majors. Um, and Rick was a journalism major at UNC Chapel Hill. I have known Rick forever. I never knew that, right? Like, I never knew that. And so there's these things that we put so much time and effort and money in, right? Like, where are you going to school? What are you going to major in? And 20 or 30 years later, a lot of those things don't matter. I knew Rick went to Chapel Hill just because he's a huge basketball fan. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter how I thought about him as an admissions dean. It didn't matter. I'm not quite sure it mattered that much for how he got that job at Georgia Tech. Uh, it, it just doesn't matter as much as we think it does. Totally. Well, I could keep talking to you about this forever, but I want to make sure that our, our IEC community gets a chance to um, ask questions as well. Uh, there are some questions that are in the chat that I'll um, either invite you know, the um, asker to um, unmute and ask, or if there are other questions, please feel free to put in the Q&A um, box at the bottom of your Zoom. So one of the first questions is from Kate. Kate, would you like to unmute and ask your question about alternatives to college? I, I think it's a great idea. Um, and I can see the importance of it, but I'm not sure how that it responds to the topic that this led from, which is the concentration of of students at you know the most selective schools. Because yeah, I, have a problem right with the eighty percent admit rate schools. Yeah, and I think Kate, where I I don't think I I don't love this um like idea of alternatives to college because again I think what it happens is it gets conflated in the public sphere about, oh, I don't need a bachelor's degree. Um, and, and I think, again, um, who knows what chat GPT and automation and artificial intelligence is going to do, but there is a, a strong need for additional education after high school. Um, and, and particularly, I believe, after writing this report I just did with Matt Singleman at Burning Glass, not just a two-year degree, but a four-year degree. In fact, we found that the four-year degree is much, much more valuable than an associate's degree. An associate's degree without transfer is, um, in some cases, worth as much as a high school diploma. And so it's not it's not really good news for the associate's degree, especially the non-applied associate's degrees, but even the applied associate's degrees are becoming um, even the need for upskilling beyond that is, is necessary. So when I talk about alternatives to college, I think about alternative pathways to the bachelor's degree so that we eventually get there and that we get there on people's own timelines, right? This belief that we need to go three months after high school to college full time for four years, when we may not know what we wanna do and take on all this debt and come out four years later, you're still only 22 at an age when, in an era where we're gonna live, hopefully into our 80s and 90s, we're gonna be working for a long time, where we're gonna have multiple careers, where we're gonna to have to upskill and reskill throughout our careers. This rush to, this rush to college and through college works very well for some, but it doesn't work well for others. And that that's the group that I would like to figure out, how do we help them? Um, uh, and how do we help their parents? But because I think we, there's, go ahead. If we help them, are we, are, is that going to have any meaningful impact on the on the three point one nine percent admit rate at Harvard? No, it's, no. it's not. That's right. It's yeah. not. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> oh, my my background is falling apart here. No worries. Um, yeah, I I see that Lauren has her hand up. But before we get to Lauren, I want to make sure we get. Um, you see the magic now. You see that's not. <laughs> yeah, my I real thought office. this was your actual background. Like, I didn't know it was an actual screen. My green screen. That was amazing. <laughs> Um, Jennifer, do you want to um, unmute and ask your question about um, the socioeconomic status and activities listed? Or I'm happy to read it out as well. If you want to oh, 
All right, I'll read out her question. So data shows that there is a strong relationship between socioeconomic um, status and the number of activities that are listed and the number of leadership positions listed for a given student. Do you foresee colleges pushing the Common App or coalition to reduce the number of activities students can list in the applications? Any other ways to level that playing field? No, I, I don't. First of all, I, I don't see them pushing the the um, Common App. I, making changes to the Common App is just so difficult. Um, and as they get more members, you know, now over a thousand members, I think it becomes even just more difficult um, to do that. So the question then is other ways to level that um, uh, playing field. Um, I, I'm really kind of disappointed that uh, uh, the reporting on uh, the College Board landscape was so bad a couple of years ago um, that they saw it as a, you know, it was the front page of the Wall Street Journal as an adversity score uh, that went along with your SAT score. I um, mean, this is obviously pretest option, so who knows what would have happened to the landscape anyway. But I think giving uh, college admissions officers more context to where the student is growing up, where they're going to school. The high school profile helps a little bit with that, but the more context that the admissions officer has about where, did, where is the student coming from? What do they have to do in their daily life? Uh, I think would put that to, to me is what levels the playing field. The um, you know more affluent, more privileged students are always gonna have access to doing more things. They're gonna have more time, right? I see this in my own family. I, I just think of how much time and money we spend on our kids. Um, and I'm incredibly lucky to have that, right? Like this afternoon, I could go at three o'clock in the afternoon to one of my kids' games, right? I could take them and pick them up from practice. Uh, I could get up at five o'clock in the morning and take them to swim practice. There's all these things I can do that a lot of parents I know can't do, right? And so I'm not gonna stop doing that. But I think that somebody who can't do that should not be seen as, oh, they didn't participate in those activities, thus we should not admit them. But we need to know that, right? We need to know that they didn't have access to that. And again, that's why I loved the College Board uh, landscape um, uh, from a couple of years ago. Um, and, and until we have better data that admissions officers could look especially quickly at and understand in a quick way, um, we're never going to have, I, I don't think that's that's going to be, that's what's going to eventually level the playing field, in my opinion. Totally. Thanks for sharing. Lauren, thank you for your patience. Feel free to ask a question. Hello. Um, so one thing I've been thinking a lot about is, is there a disconnect between what employers are looking for, both soft skills and hard skills, and what our colleges are teaching. So when you tour schools, as we all do, there is so much emphasis on, you know, the freshman orientation and the, the climbing gym and the, you know, all those sorts of things that, that are interesting when you get to a school. We get one or two statistics about, you know, 90% of our grads are employed within six months of graduation. And that's sort of the end of it. You have to go do a lot more digging to figure out what are really the outcomes of the students in this college that have a business degree or a film degree or whatever. And I, I tend to feel like we're, we focus a lot on the wedding sort of and not the marriage. And it's hard to get that information. And so my question to you is, do you think there's a disconnect between what employers want, both in critical thinking and or hard skills like coding and what students are getting at for your colleges? Definitely. Um, and I also think that when parents think about outcomes, they're not thinking on that front. Um, in fact, I, you know, I wrote this book, you know, There's Life After College years ago, which was really about how to get skills in college, you know, what to do in college to prepare for life after college. I would take this book out, I would talk to parents about it who were in high school, or parents who have kids in high school. And at the end of every talk, inevitably, the first question would be, oh, that's all fine and good, but just tell us how to get our kid into fill in the blank college. The journey to them, the end of the journey to them is where they are right now. It's getting in. They don't want to hear about, oh, like, you know, 50% of kids don't graduate in four years, right? Um, you know, a third of students change their major their first year. A uh, you know, a third of students are, are, are not returning for their sophomore year. There's all these things. And everybody says, well, that won't happen to my kid. Um, and I said, well, here's our, here are things that you could be thinking about, you know, the summer before first year college and during college to get them more actively involved. So there is this disconnect. And, and I think that we are focused on what I call 
two of the three legs of the stool. And again, I, I'm, I'm going to make sure that you all get this copy of this bachelor's degree, or you could go to jeffsalingo.com and you could find that pretty easily. Um, it's making the about making the bachelor's degree valuable. We just came out with this report a couple of weeks ago. And, and what was interesting, and we were looking at the burning glass data, and if you're not familiar with burning glass, what they look at is they look at the job market in real time. So they're constantly uh, scrubbing job ads to look at what are the key skills and demands that employers are looking for. And what we found when we looked at the value of the bachelor's degree, we found that two legs of the stool, stool are not surprising to you. One was selectivity does matter, right? So students who come from more selective schools do better. It doesn't mean that the bachelor's degree has no value at less selective schools, but it has more value at more selective schools. Not surprising, right? They are getting, you know, they're, they're going to the top jobs on Wall Street and things like that. So they're going to skew those numbers. Second, majors matter. Um, you know, so STEM majors. Um, in fact, STEM majors matter more than even the selectivity of the institution. One of the more interesting findings from this report is that if you major in engineering at a less selective college, you're going to make just as much in many cases as an engineering major at a more selective college. So it actually doesn't, selectivity doesn't really matter for a lot of, for some majors. Um, so STEM does well, right? But even less, uh, you know, lesser majors in terms of earnings still do well when it comes to the bachelor's degree. Okay, so those are two of the legs of the stool that we kind of know. The third leg that was kind of surprising to me and one we don't talk enough about, it's skills. Not only what are the, is the degree you're coming out with, but what are the skills you know? Are you a history major that knows how to manipulate big data sets, knows data analytics, and knows how to visualize that data with all of these different pieces of software out there? I'll never forget last year being at a conference uh, that Salesforce put on and I was talking to a VP at Salesforce and they were telling me about their kid who was graduating with an English major. And they told them, learn Adobe Creative Suite, like learn everything in that Adobe Creative Suite. Not only did they learn it, they got certified in it, right? They got a, a badge for learning that. And boy, did that help them get their first job. But we don't tell students that, right? We don't tell them, come out with these skills. And one of the things that we found in this survey or in this study is that especially if you have a skill that is pretty rare in your major. So for example, data analytics. Data analytics is really hot right now, right? It is, it is what uh, a foreign language was when I went to college in the early 1990s. It's what coding was, I think, five or, or six years ago. And, um, and so data analytics is really hot. Now, what we found is if you're a business major, it's kind of table stakes, right? It's just, it's expected. You really need to know, you know, you really need to know data analytics if you're a business major. If you're a history major, not so much. So by the way, if you come out with that or you're a philosophy major or name one of many other majors, right? Or you're an English major who has financial you know, acumen. Um, that is, those are skills that are really gonna put you over the top with those majors. So it's really critical. It's really critical to, to realize that and know that. And the problem is we don't talk enough about that uh, and we don't help students navigate getting those skills in, in college. What a good point. And I think skills is something that um, you're right in that we don't talk nearly enough about, it, especially even so softer skills like writing, right? Like how do we help students actually get the kind of writing skills or you know communication skills that would benefit them really no matter what um, profession they go into? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a really great point. There's another question in the chat from... Um, Karen, I believe, Karen Spencer. Do you want to unmute and ask your question, Karen? Um, sure. Hi, Jeff. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I had a question about, and this may be kind of too broad of a question. I realize you're not a genie and know all the things. And um, but you know, do you have a sense for what I'm concerned about the smaller regional colleges we see closing down on a seemingly weekly basis um, throughout the United States, particularly? I shouldn't say particularly in the Midwest. I'm a Midwesterner, so I'm, that's where I pay attention to a lot. But do you think of anything that they can be doing or focusing on in order to not have to close their doors, especially with the changing demographic? Um, I think about the Midwest because that's also a demographic where we're, we're, we're losing students um, in general. But any thoughts on what colleges in that um, kind of plane can be doing to better their odds of not having to shutter their doors? 
Well, a couple of things. They, they have to serve new markets of students and, and particularly adult students, right? There are 39 million American adults who have some college credit and no degree. To me, that's really low hanging fruit to get some of those students, many of which are in their backyard, back to school to complete a, a degree. We know that degree is valuable. How do we find them? How do we get them? Um, what do we provide to them? So that's that's number one. They have to move beyond the 18 to 22 year old. As you mentioned, there's just not enough of them. Right um, to to really keep these regional uh, colleges a, afloat. Second, um, we know most students um, still. Uh, this is a shocking number when I tell you know most students go to college within 50 miles of home, um, and you know so we still have this idea that we go away to college, and and there's still a, a group of students who do that who travel you know across state lines to to go to college. But most colleges, most students are still going in their backyard. Okay, what do those students need? Because most of those students not only will go to college in their backyard, they're going to stay in their backyard to work um, and, and, and live, right? So what are the needs of the regional economy? And let's double and triple down on that um, as a college or university. And let's stop focusing on all these other things. There's been a lot of press. I live here in Washington, D.C. Um, we're actually taking our podcast over there in a couple of weeks to Marymount University in Northern Virginia. And they've been getting a lot of press recently. They were just in a lead in a New York Times op-ed because they dropped a bunch of uh, uh, liberal arts court, uh, majors. Do you want to know why? They had one or two majors, right, in many of these liberal arts, right? It's not that means they don't stop teaching the liberal arts, but there's no reason to have departments and majors. They got highly criticized for this. But you want to know where they put their money and their effort after that? In cybersecurity. They have 500 students now in a cybersecurity program. There's more demand than they have seats in that. Do you want to know why? Cybersecurity in Northern Virginia, incredibly hot, right? These people want to stay in Northern Virginia. They want to go to school in Northern Virginia. They want to work in Northern Virginia, and they want a local, somewhat affordable option to do that. I don't think that, I don't think a call, and the lead really just annoyed me in the New York Times op-ed because it was like, is a college a college if it doesn't have an English major? Yes, it still is a college. I'm sorry, right? Not everybody needs to do everything. And if I were a regional college, those are the two things I would focus on. Local economy to grab those 18 to 22 year old students who really want to go to school locally and want to have a job locally, really pairing up with the local economy. And number two, looking at those adult students that are beyond that 22 to you know 18 to 22 year old uh, demographic that is incredibly shrieking right now. That's Thank so you. Thank you. Um, Kareem had a... Um, question that is related to the current one. Do you want to unmute and ask? Hi, sorry. I, I will turn my camera on. I was sneaking lunch in. Sorry. No um, worries. Yeah. So Thanks just for... the current question, I'm just going to read what I wrote, which is I, I give families who are interested a list of websites where I tell them you can go here, these different resources to research on your own, the financial viability of a college, if they're concerned about the ones they're looking at. I won't do that. It's far above my pay grade, and I believe it's far more complicated than a simple grade of A to F, and we know that sometimes the criteria that some of these places use isn't particularly useful or predictive, right? We've seen colleges with a C- minus rating go down the tubes, and colleges with D rating survive for years and decades. So my question to you is, what answer would you give to a parent who said, I'm concerned about the financial stability of this college, how should I find that out? Where should I look? What would well, you I mean, so so the education department does give financial scores out, right? You can look up um, uh, the bond, you know, more about, you know, bond rate. Most of these, not most of these colleges, a majority of colleges are, uh, you know, do get bond ratings, which give kind of a, a look at their financial health. Um, you know, they're auditing and 990s are public. Um, so you can look at uh, forms like that, you know, they're both their, their financial audit, but their 990s, you know, their financial audit usually will be on their website, not always. Um, uh, now, you know, a lot of people can't read a financial audit necessarily, right, or a 990 form, but it kind of gives you a sense of where they are. Um, I think that despite the popular press, a lot of colleges are struggling. A lot of colleges, though, are not on the brink of closure. Right. We are we are not going to suddenly see um, and, and I'll, you know, I'll, this is being recorded. So you'll come back to me in six months or a year if I'm wrong. But we are not on the brink of, of a massive number of college closures. We really are not. I co-host my 
podcast with Michael Horn of, uh, of the Clay Christensen Institute, you know, Clay Christensen was famous for saying, you know, hundreds of hundreds of colleges are going to go out of business. It's just not going to happen. So um, now, will we see, you know, kind of onesies, twosies here, right, where we're going to have, you know, you know, I, I think, yeah, we're going to see probably more than we have in the past, but one or two a month. And most of these, by the way, are tiny. They're under a thousand students um, in most cases. So I don't think it's something that parents and students have to worry about too much. Should they worry about the financial health of their major? Of are they going to get the resources that they need when they're in college? Sure, these are good questions. I don't think though it should be a a sense of oh, is the school going to close or not? It's more about am I going to get the resources that I need to be successful at this college? Yeah. All right, we have around five, six more minutes. There are a couple more questions that are in the Q&A. And for the sake of time, I'll just read them out and call out the person. Yeah, Jen, there, there was this one from Jennifer further up that I actually had an opinion on. Uh, the oh, yeah. Brown University admissions officer. Yes, go ahead. What, what was the question again? If you don't so it was in a recent interview, and this was in the New York Times over the weekend, because um, it was in a piece that I was also quoted in, uh, that um, that the truly competitive applicants of the poll have fallen from 75% to closer to 60% with the dramatic guys. I, I have no idea how this person would make that number. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the author of that piece, of that newsletter, asked me the same exact question. And I couldn't answer because I said, I don't even know. First of all, if you're not inside the process, you don't really know. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you would make that. Uh, to me, that's just a made up number from 75 to 60. And, and what do we mean by competitive, right? Um, and so, and I don't think it's all because of um, uh, of, of, of the test score. So, uh, you know, the fact that we have all of these, you know, the, the belief there is that we have all of these kind of wasted apps, you know, going to these colleges. I, I just think if that makes parents feel better, um, uh, I, I guess, but I, I'm not, I, I, I just, I don't know how that number even came to be. Great. Um, so from the Q&A, uh, we had a question from Cynthia, Cynthia Torres. What is your perception about the importance of academic research and selective college admissions? How can students best relay their motivations for undertaking these projects and the insights that they gain? Is undertaking a mentored research project now expected from STEM students in particular or no? Um, sorry, I just have to laugh at that because uh, there is that anecdote in my book about mm -hmm. neuroscience, right, where, you know, there's no example of neuroscience in the file you know, for an 18 year old. Um, does research help? Sure. Um, not having research, does it hurt? No. Um, and so I, I don't think it's expected. I think though, especially in the sciences, especially at highly competitive schools, things like that do make the difference. Um, and so if you want to major in, you know, these very competitive STEM programs at very, very competitive schools, that is going to be a difference maker. But going back to what I was saying earlier, um, you could actually major in STEM at a less competitive college and still do very well. Uh, um, it may not get you into medical school. I know getting into medical school right now, if that's the goal, is very, very difficult. Um, but you also don't know what you're going to do in college, right? So you may go to a less competitive school, do a lot of undergraduate research in, in, in research, or I'm sorry, research as an undergraduate rather than as a high school student, and that can help you later on. Um, but I, I think that this belief that, oh, everybody has to do research in high school to be competitive, I think is, again, putting a lot of pressure on students in an unnecessary way. Totally. There's another question from Helen Ingerson in the chat about, um, we know the U.S. news rankings aren't the greatest to assess educational quality, and especially as a lot of um, universities are pulling out, too. Um, are there any rankings we could point parents to that actually evaluate what students' parents think? Um, the U.S. news rankings assess? Um, not really. Um, uh, I think that the best rankings are, you know, I, I really do like actually like the new tool that the New York Times has yes. uh, that they put out a couple of weeks ago that really personalized the rankings. It still requires you to know a little bit about what you really want out of college. Um, but again, this is such a personal journey and a personal fit. Um, uh, I think the rankings are helpful in helping you understand the landscape and helping you understand, you know, putting data out there that helps you understand, you know, where you're applying to. But to use them as any sort of differentiator, what bothers me about the, any of the rankings is that somebody says, well, that's not a top 50 school or that's not a top 75 school. The differences between number 75, 50, 40 are so minor. 
um, and silly in many ways that I don't think you can say, oh, school 40 is that much better than school 75. Is it for certain students majoring in certain things? Sure. But those are things that you should be trying to ferret out while you're, you know, at, on tours and trying to understand, are the faculty good? Are the students getting placed into internships in those programs and things like that? The rankings are not going to tell you any of that. Very helpful. There's actually also recently, I think, a podcast on the um, on the journal about why some schools are pulling out of, of U.S. news rankings and you know, sort of the whole controversy around that. So also recommend that. If um, Great. Now we have one more minute. Um, I think there are, there's one more question that um, Jennifer Jameson had a question from the Q&A. Should we encourage the clients with scores that fall in the average range? And I think she's, she's, she means test scores um, to submit their scores if the college is optional, test optional. <laughs> um, I'm assuming the average would be like somewhere in the middle 50%. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do what Stu Schmill, who was the Dean of Admissions at MIT told me, when I was working on that piece I mentioned earlier about New York Magazine, and he said he has neighbors, kids, you know, neighbors come up to him or applying everywhere, and they ask him the same question, and he says, "I have no idea," and he's been doing this for twenty-five plus years. I and I really I can't. It's, it's hard to answer that question. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the high school. So, okay, in general, I think the the higher they are in that, you know, if they're in the top twenty-five percent or in the upper range of the middle fifty percent. Uh, I would probably lean toward yes, uh, but I would look very carefully at how their score also fits in with their high school that they're going to, especially their the students from their high school who went to that college previously. So don't just look at the overall middle 50 percent, but are the schools elevated at their high school and that the students who went from that high school got accepted at high school to that college did they tend to be in the top 25%, for example? If they did, then just being in the average from that high school is not going to be good enough, in other words. Totally. Last but not least, I think Vina Rao had her hand raised. Uh, Vina, do you want to unmute and quickly ask your question before uh, we end? I actually did, I did put it in the chat. I was trying to remember if you were the one who had um, written an article about this, the idea that there was a movement at some point um, to allow students to be able to do a targeted degree rather than do the traditional four-year pathway into university, try and allow kids who knew what their pathway was, just like universities in um, England, for instance, yeah. come in, do a three-year degree pathway, and then leave. Is there any movement or momentum for universities to even explore that? Uh, there is a big movement right now. There was just announced, in fact, I had it in my newsletter yesterday, uh, uh, ETS, you know, which used to, you know, which, you know, the big testing agency um, and the Carnegie Foundation, which kind of came up with the idea of the college credit, um, which is based on how much time you spend in a seat in a college classroom. Um, uh, they've, they've started to really make this movement towards competency-based or mastery-based learning, right? That you essentially move on once you've mastered something. Slightly different than what I think you're talking about, but this idea that we have to have 120 credits to graduate with a bachelor's degree, and that 120 credits is based on how much time you spend inside and outside of classroom working on a particular course, I think that is starting to move. Um, is it going to be in the next five or 10 years? No, because of the way things move in higher ed, it will be a while, but I think we are going to start moving in that direction. Awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. This hour has seriously just flown by. Um, I've learned so much and I'm sure a lot of our IACs on the call today also really appreciated your time and the insights that you've shared. Um, thank you again. We will be sending out an email um, to everyone with some of you know Jeff's most recent um, reports as well as books. Um, and thank you again for your time. This is so wonderful. It was wonderful to be here uh, with all of you. Good luck with all of your work. And thank you for what you do um, for students and, and parents and communities. Appreciate awesome. it and have a good day. Thanks, Jeff. Bye-bye. And IECs, if you guys could stay on the call for just the next five, 10 minutes, we're just going to do a quick raffle um, for sort of to conclude our IEC Appreciation Month, and I'll, I'm going to invite my colleague and partner in crime, Ryan, up to announce um, the four winners. Um, and, and after that, we'll let you go. So thank you so much for your patience and for your eager participation today. All right. So there I've got is. a random, I've got a randomizer here, and I'm going to pull names out of a hat. And if you can just um, take yourself off mute and, and say that you're here 
um, well, you can you can uh, accept your prize. So first winner is drum roll. Drum roll. Greta Van Ochten. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Greta. Is Greta on the call right now? I think uh, Maureen think might she may have. She's she on the call. Off, She's a winner. We'll, we'll get in touch with her afterwards. Okay. Congrats, Greta. Next winner is... Lauren Joyce. She had to leave, but I'll text her and let her know. Amazing. Yes, she, okay, she asked a bunch of questions. Awesome. Woo. Congrats to Lauren. All right. Laurie Kopp Weingartner. Oh, I'm here. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yay. That's Woo, congrats, Lori. Okay, thank you. Have you had a student do polygons before? Or yes, I have. Awesome. Yes, I have. It's been a good experience. But um, and I think now is a few are doing the um are inquiring about the pathfinders. Huh? So yeah. All Amazing. right. Great news. Awesome. Great. Thanks. And then the last one is Danny Yu. I think also maybe already hopped off. So we'll okay. get in touch with the three lucky winners who were unfortunately not on, not on the call, but congrats everyone. We're super excited to be giving out these four pro bono projects. I know a lot of you work with pro bono students as well. Um, so you guys can choose sort of which deserving student to, um, to, to get this prize, but um, your partnerships manager will reach out to you and organize sort of the logistics of it all. And thank you all for all the work that you do and for being here today. Seriously, I hope you guys had a great time and we'll be sending out a feedback form. Um, so please take three minutes to fill it out to give us some feedback on the event. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you from Ohio on the road. Right. Amazing. Thanks for calling <laughs> me. Bye. Bye. DJ, why don't we just actually end the meeting?